East Kilbride, town of tomorrow, seen from the air, depicts a far-sighted plan well on the way to accomplishment. Spacious roads with pedestrian underpasses and roundabouts, modern houses which architects have designed with the best skill at their command, efficient industry combining the most useful and successful methods of modern production, all have their roots in this new town where this film was completed in the autumn of 1954. By now, this project has become well developed. The population is around 8,000 to 10,000, and the family breadwinners have good jobs within easy distance of their homes. In the allocation of houses, priority is given to persons working in the new town, or going to jobs there, and to East Kilbride residents whose housing needs are urgent. The planners have taken into account the needs of people of all ages. Starting with suitable houses for young married couples, they provide also flats for the unmarried and cottages for the old people. Not one type of person has been forgotten. Larger houses too, for those who wish to pay a higher rent. Factories have been planned so that the worker shall give us his best. Although he always likes to be away first. How did all this utopian scheme of things come about? The Clyde Regional Plan was responsible originally, and this in turn was set afoot by Secretary of State Tom Johnson on the 22nd of March, 1943. He wanted to call a halt to unplanned sprawl. This unplanned sprawl meant that the larger cities were going on enlarging themselves, and all the unpleasant, unhealthy, inefficient, and consequently uneconomic factors were being enlarged too. On top of this, there was the ever-increasing distance of travel between home and work, with long, fatiguing train journeys and endless bus queues. The Secretary of State wished to plan on a regional basis for the health, prosperity and social well-being of the people, for the efficiency of their industry and the beauty of the countryside. The outcome of this was the Clyde Regional Plan, which, briefly, consisted of the planning of new industries by setting up industrial estates, the reduction of housing densities, and the provision of a green belt to separate main communities. To achieve these aims, new towns were to be built in the region, and one of these was to be at East to Bride. The new town had to conform to certain requirements as laid down in the Abercrombie Report. Firstly, it had to be near, but not too near, Glasgow. East Kilbride is 10 miles south of that city. Secondly, it should have a natural barrier, or green belt, in this case, Kathkin Braes, separating it from Glasgow, so that the atmosphere can never become polluted, and so that the two may never join together. The Braes automatically provide the green belt, which remains a major factor in preserving open space and producing food. Thirdly, freedom from subsidence was the next factor to check. A thorough examination had to be made of the type of subsoil, 
and whether there had been any mining activities there in the past. A plentiful supply of water, pure and of quality, was the fourth essential, and East Kilbride Bank Lanarkshire for making this available from the great Dar Reservoir. This reservoir is being built, obviously not to supply East Kilbride alone, but a large part of Lowland Scotland. For electricity, the grid meets all requirements, and the town is also well supplied with gas, which comes from the board's works eight miles away. A railroad exists both for passenger traffic and for goods. For the old established firm of Naver and Coulson, it brings raw materials and carries away the finished product. Purification works are being built at Phillips Hill to look after the sewage problem. East Kilbride had no difficulty in meeting all these basic requirements. In due course, after preliminary investigation and planning, the inaugural ceremony took place in the existing school in East Kilbride. Chairman of the large and distinguished meeting was Sir Patrick J. Dolan. Varied public authority interests were represented. Mr. Arthur Woodburn, the Secretary of State for Scotland at that time, inaugurated the new town of East Kilbride on the 12th day of June, 1948. sunny day was a good omen for the ambitious plan. On the same day at nearby White Moss, under the eagle eye of the surveyors, Miss Mitchell, the veteran planner and member of the Development Corporation, put in the first peg. This first peg marked the creation of Tom Johnson's idea of five years before, and it was a symbol of things to come. It was also the signal to start work on the building of the new town in earnest. In the creation of such a project, it is essential to have a master plan, but as this takes time, and in order to allow building to proceed with all possible haste, it was necessary to place the first houses beside the existing areas where roads and drainage came easily to hand and where mains for electricity and gas were available. These first houses were built at a time when some materials were in short supply, and these houses were of experimental types for that reason, some having light steel frames or aluminium roofs, or no fines instead of bricks. Meanwhile, let us look at two important sites. First, the site of the new civic centre. In 1948, all that was visible was undulating pastures, farming lands with cattle grazing. The site chosen lies to the south of the present village, in the fork formed by the junction of the town's two new main roads, and is easily accessible from all parts of the town, as well as from outside. Six years later, roads have now been formed, and the outline of what is to become the civic centre has started. And second, the site of the Mechanical Engineering Laboratory, which is a branch of the government's Department of Scientific and Industrial Research. The government decided upon East Kilbride as a location for basic research in mechanical engineering as an aid to industry. In due course, main cures were laid, new areas were opened up, houses were built. New designs were tried out. By the end of March 1950, about 300 houses were either completed or on the way. In autumn 1954, nearly 4,000 homes have been provided or in the course of building, and the output of housing planned at a minimum of 1,000 homes a year. The ultimate aim is for some 12,000 houses. Several types are being tried out, 
each with an eye to these two main factors, efficiency and cost. The fashion of the terraced house has returned. By building terraces, less land is taken from agriculture, although each tenant still has a garden. To direct this hive of activity is the Development Corporation. Torrance House, a delightful country mansion on the Straven Road, was acquired to accommodate the staff and provide boardroom for corporation meetings. At the same time, the corporation staff were gradually recruited, their duties having been performed at the beginning by civil servants, private architects and surveyors. The drawing offices are at Cotton's house. They have all the latest equipment, including a planimeter, a useful little gadget for measuring the actual acreage of fields, woods, etc., from plans. The planner runs the instrument round the field to be measured and by calculation obtains the result. Comprises planners, architects, surveyors, and office staff in all over a hundred. A pencil is sharpened to give point to a certain plan. Sometimes, when required, a model of a particular housing area is reproduced by means of a mock-up to see the effect of a certain idea. The board of the corporation at the beginning, under the chairmanship of Sir Pat Dolan, comprised eight members, including Miss Elizabeth Mitchell, who knocked in the first peg. Mr John Mann, convener of Lanarkshire, is deputy chairman. There are four heads of departments acting under the direction of Major General Dixon, the general manager. Through the years, there have been various retirals and resignations, till in 1954, under the same chairman, the corporation has amongst its members Sir Andrew McKenth, chairman of the Mechanical Engineering Research Board. As Torrance House is some two miles from the old East Kilbride, a bus runs daily to convey the staff backwards and forwards. The plan provides for the character of the existing village to be retained, although a good deal of tidying up of obsolete property will be necessary. The village is not really suitable for a new town centre because of the narrow roads and crowded buildings. It was decided that the centre and the village should be a fair distance apart, though not too far, since the town has to depend on the village for a number of needs until new facilities are provided. And so it was essential to leave an area for the centre and build round it and upwards. The village lies immediately to the north of the centre, and accordingly, the first large-scale housing area was sited to the south of it. Thus, there are lots of traffic passing through the centre, and its future growth and success are secured. A new town, with an initially small population, cannot instantly acquire all the social amenities. Therefore, it has to depend on the village for many of these, such as churches, it can acquire them at its own hand. Plans for new churches of all denominations are in being. Other social activities, such as the annual crowning of the East Kilbride Queen, take place on the village green, if the weather's fine. This crowning ceremony had to take place in the town hall. The games afterwards, the finals of the five-side football, were rather a washout.
These little fellows grimly stuck it out. Not so this wee chap, who thought it better to stay at home and read. And who could blame him with central heating in the house and plenty of hot water? For baths and washing up, of course. One housing area has a communal heating plant which serves houses with piping hot water and central heating. All housing development areas have the main roads and bus routes going round them. Shopping centres are provided in each area for the convenience of housewives. So economising in shopping time. Also economising in pen pushing, of course. And the schools are right in the centre of the areas, thereby keeping the pupils in quieter and safer roads. Surrounding the town, fresh vegetables arrive quickly in the shops. There's nothing so satisfactory as a newly cut cauliflower. Out of the garden, into the pot. This is the canteen of the Mechanical Engineering Research Laboratory, which is benefiting from the green belt. The large and bright experimental laboratory which catches every glint of sunlight, carries out basic research in the properties of materials and the mechanics of solids. This recent development at the laboratory is a fully automatic machine for measuring the pitch errors of gear wheel teeth. It measures them to an accuracy better than one ten thousandth part of an inch. The mechanism, operating on the two steps formed by precision slip gauges, turns the gear by one tooth at a time. This precision indicator measures, in turn, the spacing of the successive tooth flanks. The results of these measurements are plotted automatically by this recording unit so the machine can be left to measure the gear without any human assistance. In fact, it even switches itself off when the test is finished. Another project of importance is the Rolls-Royce factory at Nurston Industrial Estate. We see it in the initial stage of construction. the form of the building begins to take shape, with all the girders looking rather like the skeleton of some prehistoric monster. The factory building includes spacious and well-equipped machine and assembly shops, process plant and stores, together with an imposing two-floored office building with a modern facade in Portland's tone. The factory was quickly completed and made ready to start production, and it was officially opened by the Right Honourable Duncan Sands, Minister of Supply, on November 20th, 1953. The name Rolls-Royce conjures up an ideal method of motoring that more or less any car will feel good on the roads near East Kilbride. Giant tractors and bulldozers flatten the countryside for the roads. They're made more like a railway than a road. Rather than go round a hill, they cut right through it.
three lovers would have a pang at this episode. It required two tractors coupled to pull it down. However, tree lovers will rejoice to know that hundreds of thousands of trees are grown from seed in the nurseries at Torrance House. Trees of every kind and description for transplanting to the shelter belts and open spaces. Belts of woodland already exist in East Dubai. New ones have been established. These will act as wind breaks to abate the force of the southwest wind and deflect cold air currents from the town itself. Bridges are being built to span the dips in the countryside. Bridge building was regarded as a feat of engineering in older days, but now at East Kilbride, with modern methods at their disposal, it is regarded as commonplace. to enjoy anything is to do it in style. So let's take a jaunt in a Rolls-Royce car over the Rolls-Royce roads. A principal feature of the new town is the realignment of the main roads. These traffic roads have been designed to take the through traffic clear of the residential area and of the town centre. There has been no access to these roads except at chief road junctions. years of work, East Kilbride can give a fair account of itself. To keep in step with the houses, schools, churches and shops, more factory jobs are coming forward. One establishment, opened recently, manufactures pumps, while another to follow quickly will make women's clothing and a third, household electrical appliances. Meanwhile, house building will proceed at the rate of a thousand houses completed per annum. Surely a worthwhile effort to keep pace with the citizens of tomorrow. The future of the new town will lie in their hands when it is completed in ten years' time or so. The children who today play so happily in the healthy open-air surroundings of their new homes will all too soon be the men and women who work in the factories, shops and offices which are now being built. Life will not always be a merry-go-round for them, but at least they are assured of a future full of purpose, with opportunities for work and leisure which were not always available to their parents. Their sturdy good health and youthful vitality will see to it that our plans of today become, in fact, the reality of tomorrow. <laughs>